Yes, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my talk is about catecholamine metabolism in neuroblastoma and monitoring of catecholamine metabolites in patients with neuroblastoma. Um, so, as most of you may know, neuroblastoma is the most common extracranial solid tumor in the pediatric age group. Uh, in the Netherlands, we have about 25 to 30 new patients every year, and the average age at diagnosis is 18 months. Uh, yes. Here you see a scheme of uh, the development of the nerve system with the neural crest cells from which neuroblastoma arises moving and migrating through the body to different sites including the adrenal medulla which is the most common site where neuroblastoma arises. But besides here it could also arise here in the sympathetic side chains and because of its neuronal origin, these tumors also tend to excrete catecholamines, which we use for diagnosis. So how does it actually work in the clinic? We have a patient with suspected neuroblastoma. We collect urine from this patient. Then we analyze it for the most common markers, VMA and HVA. And the doctors say, well, it's likely or less likely to be neuroblastoma. However, these markers have a combined sensitivity of 85%, which means that structurally you would miss 15% of the patients if you only include these two markers. So we ask ourselves, what about other metabolites? And this is a simplified scheme of how catecholamines are made and broken down. And it starts with the amino acid tyrosine, which is converted stepwise by different enzymes to L-DOPA, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, which are then broken down to 3-methoxytyramine, normethanephrine, metanephrine, and finally the end products, HVA and VMA. So um, most of the labs in the world focus on these two markers, but we in the Netherlands included all the other red markers in our panel. So the first question we asked ourselves was, can we improve diagnostic sensitivity if we include additional markers? And secondly, if we include additional markers, can we also say something about prognosis? Can we actually estimate risk assessment based on metabolites level? So um, we did a large scale retrospective cohort study, including eight markers at the moment of diagnosis. We included all patients between 1990 and 2014, which eventually ended up at 301 patients. And we separated them into a test cohort and a validation cohort based on the treating hospital. The two cohorts were pretty similar when it comes to uh, clinical demographics, so we could also compare the two. If you look at the graph on the left side, you see the diagnostic sensitivity of every metabolite, including the combination of HVA and VMA, which in our cohort was 84%. And as you can see, normethanephrine as a single marker is already more sensitive. And when you combine normethanephrine with other markers, for example, 3MT, you get a sensitivity of 92%. And the whole panel gives us a sensitivity of 95%. So it's an improvement of 11% compared to the classical markers. And you can say, well, this is not that interesting. But if you focus on patients that are actually more difficult to diagnose, for example, patients that have an MIBG scan that is non-avid, so you don't see the tumor on the MIBG scan, you see that these patients tend to be negative for the classical markers. So these are actually really hard to diagnose patients. But if you implement other markers, like normethanephrine, 3MT, you can actually get an increase of 56% in diagnostic sensitivity for these patients. So we definitely see an improvement in diagnostic sensitivity if we add additional metabolites. 
The next question was, can we improve risk assessment based on um, additional metabolites? And according to the Dutch protocol, we currently look at stage of the disease, age of diagnosis, whether or not the MYC oncogene is amplified, and whether or not 1P is lost in the tumor. And based on these four factors, we divide patients into either observation, low risk, medium risk, and high risk patients. And as you all know, the risk groups corresponds with the uh, expected prognosis of the patients and also the treatment that we give them. Um, other risk protocols like the Siopen also include um, 11Q. You also have histology, the American group. But um, according to what we know now, we see that most of the risk schemes are actually suboptimal, leading to classification of patients as high risk while they're actually responding really well and should be actually treated less intensively. But also patients that are falsely classified as low risk should actually be upscaled faster and receive more intensive treatment to save them. So it leads us to the necessity of a more sensitive biomarker. And currently we have a lot of gene signatures telomerase activity, which is the topic of the next talk. And uh, we want to see if we can actually use biochemical markers such as catecholamines for this role. So first of all, we looked into can we estimate correlation between elevation of the different markers and various clinical factors, such as age of diagnosis, stage and mainly stage four disease, risk group, high risk, make amplification, loss of 1P, the site of the primary tumor, whether or not the bone marrow was invaded by the tumor, if the MIBG scan was avid or not, histopathology, and the gender of the patient. And what we saw is that from all the eight metabolites, including the ratio between the two classical metabolites, 3-metoxy theoramine correlated with seven out of 10 parameters. And actually, all the seven that are actually prognostic relevant, so the age, the stage, make amplification, bone marrow invasion, followed by the ratio between the two classical markers. So at least when you look at this, you would say, well, assuming that these risk factors determine prognosis, you would also expect that at least these two would also correlate with outcome. So we checked it further. Oh, you cannot see the gray line. Um, okay, then you would have to take it from me. <laughs> we have here a group that has um, a ratio between VMA and HVA that is above 0 0.5, and 0 0.5 is the cutoff that was already described in 1993 by uh, the Siopen group. Um, and what you see is that both in the test cohort and the validation cord, we can clearly see association between a ratio lower than 0.5 and a poor outcome compared to a ratio above 0.5. However, when you compare it, can you really see the gray line? Yeah, but that's the number of patients and events. Oh, oh OK, yeah. So you know where it's supposed to be, yes. Um, but if you compare it to elevation of 3 in its diagnosis, we see that at least the separation between the two groups is much more clear if 3MT is elevated compared to non-elevated. But from this, we can only conclude that both the ratio and 3MT correlate with clinical outcome. So we also performed um, a combined analysis where we included both 3MT and the ratio. And here you can clearly see, as indicated by the green and blue line, that if 3MT is elevated, it doesn't matter what the ratio is, the prognosis is really bad. However, for patients without 3MT elevations, you see that if the ratio is below 0.5, they do have significantly poorer prognosis. But these patients are usually patients with localized disease without amplification of the MYC oncogene. 
So in this group, we do see additional value for the ratio. And when we included the metabolites in a multivariate analysis and also uh, comparing it to other known risk factors, we saw that only 3MT is actually an independent risk factor for both event-free survival and overall survival of neuroblastoma patients. Um, this was all retrospective, so we moved on into a prospective validation. And as you can see, the top two panels are our current Dutch um, cohort from 2014 until 2018. We included 95 patients in this cohort, and also here you see that elevation of 3MT at diagnosis clearly correlates with a poorer prognosis, both event-free survival and overall survival even though our follow-up at this moment is really short. And we got um, data from Italy, because they used to measure this metabolite in the past, and also in this cohort, you see exactly the same. Elevation of 3MT correlates with a poor prognosis. So until now, we just show you that you can correlate metabolites to outcome, but we did not explain why. And according to most of the research groups, 3MT is regarded as an inactive metabolite, so it's not really a direct effect of 3MT, but probably something else. We could not correlate it to histopathology. We saw a clear correlation with genetic aberrations, but it was independent of them. And we also tested a correlation between tumor size and tumor burden, because you can also assume that if the tumor is bigger or has more metastases, it might excrete more metabolites. But that was not the case, as you can see here. So we have here the Curie score, which is a measurement for um, metastatic burden, but there is absolutely no correlation. Same goes for the primary tumor size. So we thought about how can we explain it in a different way. And we decided to compare gene expression between patients with elevated 3MT and non-elevated 3MT. So what we did is we started with the urine. We split the cohort into elevated 3MT and non-elevated 3MT. And then we compared the expression of these patients, two groups. And we ended up with a gene signature that is differentiating between the two groups. So we have eight genes, four of them are going up, four of them are going down in patients with elevated 3MT. So now we have an indication that um, the process we see in urine is also reflected at the gene level, at the expression level. And as expected, if you split patients based on the gene expression, you also get the same prognostic groups. Furthermore, when we actually try to first analyze based on gene expression, what would be the 3MT level in urine, we saw a really nice correlation. So the signature really represents the 3MT levels in the urine. Because we now have a surrogate marker for urinary 3MT, we can also do the same analysis at the gene level. So now we use the 3MT gene signature. And if the signature is high, the patient is presumed to have elevated urinary 3MT. And in this way, we were able to uh, test our hypothesis based on American patients, German patients, and since the German cohort was really big, we could also split it into localized disease without make amplification and high-risk patients. And in all cases, you see that if the signature is high, so the urinary 3MT is elevated, we see a much poorer prognosis compared to without it. So until now, I just show you a lot of evidence that we have a really good correlation between 3MT and outcome, but haven't explained why. So to explain why, we compared the 3MT signature to other known signatures in uh, the KEG database, the BROAD database, and we saw that a lot of MIC activity related signatures, uh, metabolism signatures that are associated with higher cell cycle rate, were all popping out. And when you compare our 3MT signature to MIC activity in the tumor, you see a really nice linear correlation between the two. So patients with 
high 3MT activity also have higher MIC activity in the tumor. And when you separate the cohort based on uh, whether or not the signature is high and whether or not MIC is active, this was done with a K-mean analysis. You see that 90% of the patients are clustering in these two groups, so either MIC active with 3MT or MIC inactive without 3MT. And what is striking about this plot is that um, about two-thirds of it are red circles, so these are patients with um, amplification of the MIC oncogene, but one-third is clearly not amplified. So these are all single copy patients that have MIC activity. So they're presumed to be more aggressive, but it's not based on the amplification of MIC-N. So there is something else that causes the increased MIC activity in the tumor. And this is also why, if you only looked at MIC and amplification, you would have a sensitivity of 60% for MIC activity in the tumor compared to 88 based on the 3MT. And my final slides. Um, so how would increased MIC activity would cause elevation of 3MT? At least based on our knowledge of a catecholamine metabolism at this moment and also some preliminary staining we did, we hypothesized that increased MIC activity causes eventually downregulation of the enzyme DBH, which as you can see has an inverse correlation with MIC. So we have here a lot of MIC, no DBH, and high 3MT. And this is low 3MT, no MIC in the tumor, and a lot of DBH. So it would affect the pathway here, so it would block it and would actually cause accumulation that way, leading to accumulation of 3MT. So to summarize it, um, the addition of other catecholamine metabolites increased diagnostic sensitivity, especially for patients that are actually harder to diagnose, like MIBG negative patients. What we also saw is that you can use catecholamine metabolites, mainly 3-methoxytyramine, as a prognostic biomarker. And we assume that this is because it correlates really well with MIC activity in the tumor. So we also have a biological rationale for this association. At the moment, we're working on uh, setting a European study to validate all these findings. And we want to see if we can actually correlate 3MT to increase telomerase activity, which could also explain it. But this would be the topic of the next talk. Um, as in all projects, I have to acknowledge a lot of people, mainly my supervisor, Lieve Tijdgat, and André van Kuilenburg, and also the Vila Joop Foundation for uh, sponsoring this study. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Uh, yeah. oh, Thank you so much, uh, Eden, for this uh, very clear, nice talk. Vaprosa, uh, his list. Thank you. It was a really great talk with a good prognostic significance, but I've got the very practical questions. How do you collect urine samples? How do, do you, we collect it? Yes. Yeah. Do you use 24 hour collection or a single urine sample? And what method do you use to determine the method? Yes. Okay. So um, this is a very good question, which we're actually writing down now as a position paper to show you how you can actually do that. In the past, we used 24 hours for all the metabolites. Um, but we as a lab decided to move to single portion urine, which works just as effective, is just as sensitive. We don't see a lot of changes between uh, measurements in 24 hours and single spot. Um, so the collection method could be both, but I think from a clinical perspective, the single portion urine is preferable. To answer the second question, in the past we use HPLC-based method. I'm not sure if it's... Yeah, yeah. yeah? Okay. Uh, but nowadays all the diagnostic is done on um, mass spectrometry based, so we use tandem MS.
for the analysis of, but also these two methods are comparable. So we compared the values done by both methods and we get the same results, so. so okay, thank you. And another one. Are the metabolites stable? So it's um, a bit yeah. easier to do it in uh, um, Dutch yeah. country, but uh, Russia is big in the few before I made in a single reference lab. Absolutely. Can you transport them uh, through 3,000 kilometers? Yes. Please. So this is another good question, which is uh, going to be in the same paper. Um, we have, well, I'll, I'll just go back to the scheme that might be easier. Can I go back to the scheme of the metabolites? No. Okay. Um, HVA and VMA, and also uh, normetanephrine, 3MT. Wait, oh, yes, we have it. Uh, yes. Oh. So um, these five are stable. But if you want to make them more stable, you can add acid to the urine just after you collect the urine, acidify it to a pH of 2.5, and it's okay. You can transport it like that. You can also freeze it in and transport it. That's even better. For these, dopamine, norepinephrine, and epinephrine, you definitely need to acidify the urine because they're unstable. And preferably, when you do that, you should actually keep the urine also in um, a dark container. So either a dark tube or whatever. In, in the refrigerator, it's also dark enough. But do not expose them to lie too long, because if you leave them on the bench for a whole day, you would see degradation of the metabolites. OK, perfectly manageable as a whole. Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, if, if you freeze them in and you acidify the urine, you can keep it up for uh, one and a half year easily. Yeah, so uh, by mail. On dry ice, it, it shouldn't be a problem. You can transport it. Yeah. Other questions? Well, there are no more questions, so there will be no...